to kick off our, uh, our first panel, uh, Competitiveness in Latin America, How to Close the Gap with the Developed World, uh, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Richard Lapper. Uh, Mr. Lapper is a principal at the Financial Times LATAM Confidential, uh, LATAM Confidential and FT Confidential, um, which provide uh, emerging market re research and insights uh, for investors. Uh, Mr. Lapper has worked in the FT since 1990, um, and he was the Latin America editor for 10 years between 1998 and 2008. Afterward, he spent two years in Johannesburg as South Africa um, bureau chief. He has also worked for the Latin America newsletter and the Economist Intelligence Unit. Please join me to welcome Mr. Richard Lapper and the speakers that will drive this conversation. to uh, Felipe for that introduction. Welcome to this uh, first panel, um, the subject of which is competitiveness uh, and how to close the gap between Latin America and the developed world. I must say there is a bit of a, a sense of uh, deja vu about this topic. Um, I've been covering Latin America on and off for, 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 for over 30 years and, and always the issue of productivity has been a prominent one whether it was during the, uh, the debt-ridden 1980s or the, the 1990s when um, the need for productivity informed the so-called Washington consensus of uh, liberal structural reforms. During the more recent commodity boom, the call for greater competitiveness has been a, a pretty much a constant refrain when you look at international reports from the likes of the World Bank, the Instrument Bank and Development Bank, or the the World Economic Forum. And when we at the FT started uh, Brazil Confidential in uh, our investor service uh, for, for, for investors in, in like research service for investors in Latin America in 2011, and more recently when we expanded it out to Latin America, two of the big themes were, were very much productivity related. One of them, this uh, big attempt by um, the um, Brazil, Mexico, the, uh, the more investable uh, countries in Latin America to build up their infrastructure. And uh, the second thing, this big build up in uh, education, particularly the private education boom in, uh, in Brazil. In fact, Pearson, uh, the parent group of the Financial Times, has uh, even made its own big investment in Brazilian education with an acquisition in, uh, in 2010. Now, for all that, productivity has uh, proved to be frustratingly elusive. Um, individual companies and sectors uh, might be internationally competitive. Um, I've lost count of the number of pieces I've, I've, I've written control it, uh, about the extolling the virtues of uh, Cemex, the Mexican cement company, or Embraer, the, the famous Brazilian aviation company, or Brazil Foods, or Ambev. Um, and how they highlight the way forward uh, for the region as a whole. But uh, basically, Latin American economies are still lagging uh, behind, limping along with unsatisfactory growth rates, um, and never really failing, uh, delivering what they promise. So it's interesting to me that infrastructure spending is so readily cut back in Latin America, for example, when you compare it with other emerging markets. Just look at the way that Mexico, at uh, the first sign of uh, oil price falls, cut its big uh, bullet train project linking, uh, designed to link Mexico City and Querétaro. You, know, you compare that with Indonesia that's uh, increased its budget on infrastructure spending by 60% in the last couple of months. Um, Anyway, enough of, uh, of my, my skepticism about uh, my, my journalistic skepticism. We've got a very experienced panel to discuss these issues with us. Um, Sir Mark Moody Stewart is a long and distinguished um, business career, having chaired uh, Royal Dutch Shell and, and in a non executive capacity, Anglo American. He's currently chairman of Hermes Equity Ownership. Desmond O'Connor has spent a, a lot of his working life in banking in or, or with Latin America. Luis Fernando Lopez is head economist at Patria Investment, Investimentos, which is a, a Brazilian financial company. Leonardo Uara is a, a managing director at Visagio, which uh, is, is an example of a successful uh, Brazilian company that has managed to uh, 
conquer the challenges of productivity and become uh, an, internationally, an international business. Um, and last but not least is, is Wenceslau Bunke, Managing Director of Credit Suisse's Real Estate Group. Um, so let me start by asking the panelists this. Um, do they agree that this um, gap, uh, productivity gap, has got worse or has got better? I assume we agree we're still lagging developed economies. Maybe um, uh, who wants to start on this? Uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, Desmond. Um, <coughs> Well, absolutely. I mean, the improvements uh, have been gigantic. Uh, you can draw history uh, in the sense of Latin America. Uh, I started in 59, which is long before probably most of you were born. Um, and the improvement since then has been gigantic uh, in, in almost every sense. Um, so I'm going to approach it perhaps the other from the other end <coughs> and say, well, why, do some, why have some countries done so much better than others? One of the big improvements has clearly been, I think if you, I'm not quite sure what word you want to use for it, but um, the sort of political structures of most of the countries have allowed for enormous improvements. Um, there's been much better division of uh, taxes and things in infrastructure, so you've got enormous improvements in infrastructure. Uh, I accept that there are countries that have not perhaps followed the path as keenly as others. But when you look at the countries that uh, are deemed by investors uh, and buyers of goods as successful, almost always it comes down to they've had a period of really quite good stability uh, from a foreigner's point of view, if you like. Um, and in those categories, you would have uh, now your Chile, your, your, your Brazil, Mexico, uh, Peru, Colombia. Um, they're all um, countries which have been able to take advantage of a stable situation. And it is in that climate that I think we see uh, vast improvements in, in, in uh, obviously infrastructure, but perhaps even more importantly, but much longer term, education. Um, and all these things have contributed to those countries, I think, finding it much easier to attract investment and then uh, the other way around uh, to, to, to uh, um, for, for productivity improvements which allow them to join the rest of the world in, in, in selling their products. Um, I, I think really I don't want to go much further than that at the moment because I think those, the key thing is yes, everything has improved enormously, but at the back of it I see the success comes when you have an element of stability uh, in the government, not necessarily your own political choice, but stability, um, which allows for uh, as I said, improvement in, in, in education and the like. And then a funny one I'm going to put, it's a very soft issue, but it, I've observed it. When the people who are actually doing the selling or, or managing the companies go around and have a certain pride in themselves and pride in the country, it is extraordinary how strong that can be as a marketing tool for getting things improved. And I'm thinking of some countries where uh, they've gone proudly round and sold their country and their skills, and vice versa. You've had others where they're damning their country uh, and saying it's all completely hopeless. And that really doesn't help. It's a soft issue. But funnily enough, I think it does count quite strongly. Can I, can, can I ask, can I, thanks, thanks for, um, can we move on in the sense and try and calculate how big this productivity gap is? So there has been an improvement certainly over the past 30, 40 years. How big is the gap? What is it narrow? Luis Fernando, we, you, you're at the sharp end of this, involved in, in deals that involve improving productivity. So what's your calculation of how far Latin America has got? I mean, obviously very difficult to generalize across the whole continent, but give us a sense of how far we've come and how far we've got to go in terms of measurement, measuring this issue. Certainly, Richard. Um, the usual calculation, you pick up the most productive or competitive countries, um, Western Europe, um, some selected Asian countries, and then you use them as a benchmark, and then you try to calculate the gap. So uh, they are, of course, these more advanced economies are much more productive than the average of Latin America. But uh, in the 60s and 70s, the competitiveness or productivity in Latin America was 20% of this, the benchmark. 
and now it's accelerated to some 40, 50 percent, depending on, on how you calculate this. So the answer to your question is definitely that the gap is narrowing, but still 40, 50 percent, you are far away from, from this group. So, um, and probably the answer has to do with this evolution has to do with the fact that Latin America is actually comprises very different stories. So there are some economies in which you can uh, witness or you, could, you can report a very fast uh, narrowing of this gap, uh, namely uh, the Andeans, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Panama, uh, very uh, impressive uh, performance over the past few years, Uruguay over the past few years as well. There is an intermediary group in which uh, the evolution has been a little bit more erratic, um, Ecuador, Bolivia, there are some back and forth. Um, and there is the country in which basically uh, institutions and several other things are not contributing to any narrowing. Actually, Argentina, Venezuela are the obvious case in which by any calculation, actually the productivity and the competitive in the gap is, is widening, in fact. So yes, there is progress, but then you have to be very um, selective or more, uh, you have to have more granularity what what Latin America exactly we're talking about. And how, do, how does Latin America compare with other emerging markets, if you should look at Southeast Asia, for example, or South um, Asia? It's, a little, it's, it's, it's lagging behind Southeast Asia, uh, which has very impressive uh, cases. Um, surprisingly, it's not as, uh, as bad as, uh, it's, it's relatively compared relatively well to uh, Eastern Europe and much better than um, Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa especially. So, I was in intermediary ranks, I would say. Uh, and, and finally, just in terms of trying to measure this, over the last 15 years, when there's been this success, as it were, Latin America's had a better image, has that, has that, has that rate of narrowing accelerated? Um, the, I th I th we think that the, the the pace of improvement is actually long term and has more to do with institutionals than with any super commodity cycle. Of course, the commodity boom accelerated growth and it's depending on how you measure competitiveness and productivity, it is a pro cyclical thing. The more you grow, the, f the, f the more productive you get. Um, but basically, if you look at the long term development, especially institutions, institutions I mean uh, rule of law, uh, enactment of contracts, regulation, legislation. Uh, the past 10 to 15 years um, witnesses a very significant uh, improvement. So I would say that at the margin, the past 10 to 15 years, we have seen more acceleration compared to the previous 10 to 15. So we are getting a little bit better. And we definitely think that the slowdown in economic growth that you see uh, over the past couple of years has to do with a cyclical uh, fluctuation of commodity prices, some specific issues pertaining individual economies, but the long-term trend, I would completely agree, it's uh, we are in the right direction. We are just discussing here the pace. Why Latin America lags behind Southeast Asia, for example? So the gap's narrowing, and it's, it, it's, it's getting narrowed at a faster rate. Um, the underlying picture is actually quite positive. Slow down over the past couple of years. It's not a structural issue by and large, apart from one or two project True. basket cases where there are clearly stru big yeah. structural problems. It's really about the cycle. Yes, and then, but we must be aware, this is a race. Um, 25, 50 years ago, Southeast Asia was not exactly quite obvious that it would be in the position they are right now, and they advanced it quite fast. So in this race, we are, we are speeding up, but there are other competitors who are getting even faster. So anyone, anyone and any other panelists like to comment on any of this issue in terms of this, this general, this pattern of, of productivity, this improvement we've seen over the past um, 30, 40 years, the, uh, just in terms of that, the, the process at this stage. I want to go into one in a minute into about some of the sectoral stuff. I'm happy to. A I, I agree a lot with what you said about the, uh, the improvement of the institutionalization of the markets. I think that one, uh, one of the best books that I read that helped me in understanding why Latin America was where it is and, uh, uh, and why some of the markets that had exactly the same history uh, have a uh, have completely different profile is a book called uh, Why Do Nations Fail? 
And the basis of the book is basically that those nations, uh, those countries where the institution is more important than the individual, they succeed. Those countries where the individual is more important than the institution, then those countries fail. And uh, they put as a very good example the uh, uh, way that Mexico gets conquered versus the US, and then it brings it back to today's world. And it basically, uh, with all respect to uh, uh, Mexico, where I spend a lot of time, I do a lot of business, I think it's doing a fantastic uh, work, but it basically says that if Mr. Bill Gates gets uh, uh, stopped in the street while drunk, he will go to jail like anyone else. If that happens in Mexico, most probably the police that stopped Mr. Slim will go to jail. Uh, and, it's, 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 I, and I think that that's very interesting to understand why some of these countries, from a productivity point of view, have not succeeded as much as the developed world. Um, I'm in the real estate sector, and it's interesting, when, when, when you look at the uh, professional fees that you pay in the developed world, for example, when you uh, build your house here in, in, in the UK, uh, you spend between 30 to 35 percent of uh, the total expenditure, the total cost of work in professional fees. If you do it in any country in Latin America, it would be anywhere between 8 to maximum 15 percent. Why? Because here the law is extremely important and you need to follow a lot of different regulations and you have to have people responsible to say what, it is, what is it that you're supposed to do and what is it that you're not supposed to do. When you do it in Latin America, it's much more deja vu and everyone has its own way of doing it. And that, I think, affects productivity a lot. We're, again, in a much better place than where we were 15 years ago. Yes, we are. We're not, still not at the level where we should be. And I agreed also with your comment about that this is a race uh, and that Latin America is competing with other regions. There's a very uh, large uh, investor, U.S. investor, that... Um, uh, invests globally that said something to me about six months ago that, uh, or eight months ago that really stuck my mind. He said that the best uh, bump or the best uh, thing that happened to Latin America was the tsunami in Japan. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, global uh, suppliers used to have a single chain of supply and they depended a lot on Asia. After the tsunami, companies like Toyota, companies like Apple could not uh, uh, um, uh, access all the supply given the disruption that, that has happened. That, given the higher expense that you have in, um, in, in Asia these days, cost of uh, labor, it has improved, has helped improving Latin America a lot. The big beneficiary has been Mexico. Having said that, there's a lot of other countries where there's a lot of investment going on because global suppliers want to have more than one option in their productivity line. No, I, I, I mean, I come to this from a, a, a background of the resource industry, uh, mining oil and gas and so on, but I've also watched the development from my time with Accenture of, of service uh, industries, and most recently I'm involved in a Chinese uh, wind turbine manufacturer which has started to export to Latin America. And if you, if you look at the kind of frameworks which, which are available uh, as a foreign investor coming in and looking at, at the capacity of people, uh, you know, that's clearly very good in comparison to many other parts of the world, certainly uh, Africa and, and so on, and certainly equal to uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, there are clearly in different countries, structural problems with educational systems, but, but at the top, that's, it's not an, an impediment. It needs addressing, but it's not an impediment to an incoming investor. If you look at, at the technological side, uh, there is an ample capacity for applying uh, and implementing very high levels of technology in, in the uh, mining, oil industry, uh, software, and, and so on. So that's uh, not a problem. The, the uh, wind power company, uh, Envision Energy, coming into Chile, which is a, a, a coming from a country which is not used to, has much power, much technology, but is, is 
also institutionally not that, uh, in some ways, not that uh, well established. They found it, we found it very easy to set up a company to have well-structured legal financial services in, in Chile. No uh, problem at all with a local partner who could familiarize themselves. So people, technology, some of the services, no problem. I, th I think what Leonardo said, the institutions uh, are the challenge. Uh, if I look at, at projects in, in other countries in Latin America, seriously challenged by the, the institutional delays and, and complexity and lack of sound governance. Uh, so I think that to me is the, the biggest challenge. And one has to mention uh, at some point, which is varies dramatically across the, the, the continent, corruption, uh, which is a big problem. I think my encouragement on the panel is uh, when you talk about competitiveness, is really uh, try to be more specific in, in some examples, right? And I think we, we help companies, uh, for example, in Brazil, to improve productivity in their supply chains. And I think one very simple, basic example uh, is the, the role of the government in making sure that the laws, the taxes, and the, the labor rules support businesses. And in many cases, that's not the, the, that's not the case. So if you look at the, um, I think two months ago, we, we were advising a company um, in, the, uh, in the steel sector, in the distribution, to build a warehouse. And because of the ICMS taxes, um, which is different from state to state, uh, it was more economical to put a warehouse in the state of Espírito Santo to deliver uh, goods to the state of Sao Paulo. So that goes against the basic law of uh, reasoning. Um, you, you have to travel more, 30% more, you have to spend more fuel, it's not good for the environment, and at the same time it's increased the risk for, um, for, for health and safety. So those are, these are a very basic example of uh, lack of productivity yeah, uh, generated by uh, taxes. There's a tax war at the moment across states to bring businesses, and that's not necessarily a, a good thing to, to do. And the other example is we have been helping um, a company to optimize uh, their operations in the airports. And because of the labor law, every single state and every single airport has a different flexibility. So the, uh, the, the law is on top of uh, the businesses in many, in many situations. So there are small things that can be done, but we need to be very specific on how can we support, how can the government uh, create a policy uh, and a framework that supports productivity rather than the other way around. Yeah, I strongly agree with that on, on things like labor law, which are things which have been put in place to improve standards to protect workers, which is entirely rational, but have become so convoluted, complicated, differentiated, that it's a minefield, and you're going to step on a mine several times, and it, it just slows the whole thing down. Luis Fernando, you were saying as we were talking before that you know there were the factors, and just to underline the point that's being made here, um, that uh, institutions, Mark put it, is, is a real challenge. You you were saying that seventy five. You, you reckon that seventy five percent of the of the of the, the reasons for, for underproductivity are institutional. Um, maybe just go through that argument you were telling yeah. us. There is quite a lot of research on these, and then the book uh, that Venceslao mentioned is just go addresses the, the, the role of of institutions. So uh, the whole story is uh, basically competitiveness and productivity. When we use this term, we are always usually talking about actually four different verticals. First is the macroeconomic environment. So everybody is familiar with 
interest rate, exchange rate, inflation, so on and so forth. So of course, this affects productivity and competitiveness as well. Second thing is the broad infrastructure um, structure. So I'm talking about port, roads, uh, power generation, the quality of the human resources. So that's the second factor that of course affects productivity and competitiveness. There is a third factor which is called, um, we we'll say, innovation and technological readiness, which is how fast this economy absorbs new technologies. But then the fourth factor is actually the most important of all, which are institutions. Again, uh, how the whole environment of law, regulation, how economic policy is delivered. If you have bad institutions, you fail, you are going necessarily to fail in the first three ones. So there is n there are no situation in which bad institutions are compatible with good economic policies or uh, with decent economic or human infrastructure. So actually, in the end of the day, three quarters of the long-term improvement in uh, productivity and competitiveness comes from institutions. Enhanced institutions or progress institutions means that you are going to do well in the other three verticals, and then the whole story becomes um, a virtual uh, circle. In our experience, we are a uh, Brazilian company, but we, we in, association, in association with Blackstone, we deploy capital in Brazil, of course, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay. This story is uh, very much the same across very different uh, economies. So once institutions are okay, you see the quality of economic policy is doing fine, and then uh, infrastructure could be lacking, but the, 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 the opportunities to deploy capital and create infrastructure are there. The absorption of new technologies uh, is more convenient. So the whole thing is our business experience strongly supports the, the thesis that actually institutions are the most important um, uh, aspect of this uh, productivity and competitiveness story. And then um, try to be a little bit more optimistic about how to change these, of course, reforms, comprehensive reforms would be the best uh, prescription to get the, the institutions right, so on and so forth. But it's difficult to implement compre comprehensive reforms. You have vested interests in all the countries. Um, usually when you try to change something, there are some groups or families, usually more, more often than not local families that, or groups that goes against the reform. But there is one very um, efficient way to start the, the move in the right direction. And that would be my, my modest contributions here in terms of how, what would be the pragmatic um, solution for this. If you compare Latin America with this group of more advanced economies with posts or report the highest um, standards of competitiveness and, and um, uh, productivity, typically they export and import eight to nine percent of GDP more than the average of Latin America. Latin America on average exports some 22, 23 percent uh, of, of their GDP. Uh, if you go to those other economies, you're talking about over 30 percent. So if you just open the economy more and allowing for more foreign trade within the region, Latin America, and with other economic blocks, you could add another eight, nine, ten percent of extra export import. This is probably the most efficient way to accelerate the change in institution because once you have foreign competition, you're exposed to foreign markets. The whole thing of the need to change institutions and to address infrastructure bottlenecks also becomes more evident. So I think with the pragmatic speaking, rather than trying to push for comprehensive and multi-decade reform just start to increase foreign trading within the region and with the rest of the world. You're going to see that it, I think, probably will do wonders in terms of getting in the right direction. And of those three big reforming initiatives that we've seen over the past 30 years, what's your sort of brief judgment? You know, we're talking about NAFTA, Mercosur, and now the Alliance of the Pacific. They are a very important component of this overall improvement in productivity and the narrowing of the gap, uh, but there is still an awful lot of to do. I think NAFTA pretty much stalled for, for a number of years. Um, there was some political resistance, especially in the south of Ecuador, to the whole story. And then you create this multi um, arrangement, which will try to strengthen Mercosur. Uh, there is the Pacific Alliance. Now we may be getting close to a point in which I think even the more um, cautious members of the Mercosur itself, they recognize that the, probably the best solution is to get an ample trade agreement 
And in addition to that, going further to integration in Americas, uh, there is a very uh, strong effort towards uh, increased trade integration with Asia, and I would say to Europe as well. So probably we're going to see better news compared to what we saw over the past five, five, six years. So we probably see, essentially, we take a more positive view about Pacific Alliance since it is more Asia-focused than uh, True. Mercosur, which is, an, which is moribund in terms of actually reinforcing some of the institutional difficulties we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But even within Mercosur, the idea that Mercosur would be the core that would, would expand and encompass the rest, I think it's, it is done. It's dead. No, nobody is thinking about it. You know, there is a very robust and vibrant uh, commercial block. I think probably the most uh, vibrant one in the region is the Indian, uh, the Indian, the, the Indians, and integrating with the US and then towards Asia. I think Mercosur were more resistant. They are going that way. Definitely, I see this in Brazil. Um, so Brazil has a lot, lot of noise over these days with the Petrobras scandal, so on and so forth. But when you cut across the short-term noise, um, there has been a significant change in economic policy in Brazil. Not only the short-term fiscal policy, but the attitude towards trade integration is completely different under the new economic regime. Completely different. I so think in, in we, 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 and Luis Fernando, when you make this distinction between the the, the, the macro, the, the broad infrastructure, and, uh, the, the technology and the institutions, you're including trade policy and trade structures as an institutional issue, I guess. So Absolutely, yes. Yes, definitely to trade will be, tr trade integration and any um, mo change or modification in the, 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 in the existing regulation on, on, on um, um, economic policy that allows for great, uh, great integration uh, with within the region or across the commercial blocks is, would be part of this institutional change. Anyone else want to make a comment on this trade issue in particular? Well, only that that I think there is much that could be done in in energy, water, and so on in cross border, uh, in in matching up surpluses and deficiencies. And the barrier to that is, is fundamentally historical uh, antipathies across those borders, which is, which is a pity, because in this day and age, we should be able to get past it. So being able to export hydroelectric power yeah, from Brazil to Venezuela, yeah. for example, or something like that. Or, or, you know, water in the Andes, you know. Yeah. Too much in one area and no water in the other. Yeah. I mean, one other area of institutional constraint that um, we were talking with Wenceslau about before the session, um, cap capital market structures, um, which... Uh, yes, yeah, I think that you've seen, uh, you've seen a, a, a huge improvement if, if you think about the last 15 years, how the uh, Brazilian capital markets has developed and how over the last, call it three to five years, uh, the Mexican market uh, has has developed specifically again on, on what I do, which is uh, 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 real estate. Uh, you didn't have real estate companies in uh, in Brazil uh, back in uh, before 2005 when the first uh, company was IPO'd, and since then there were close to, to uh, 20 billion dollars of uh, uh, real estate uh, capital raisings happening on the equity side on Brazil, and you see the same thing in. Uh, in Mexico, where uh, it hasn't reached the 20 billion yet, but it's pretty close to it uh, in a much shorter uh, time frame. Uh, having said that, that is really uh, a drop in the ocean on what is needed uh, in terms of uh, the capital required to uh, develop a proper uh, either capital markets or real estate sector that supports the needs of, uh, of the different countries. And I think that part of that is also what we were discussing before about uh, productivity and competitiveness, but not that much on just the real estate sector, but on the capital markets themselves. Financing is uh, one of the biggest issues that you have, and it has a, 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 a very direct link with the institutionalization of some of this, uh, um, uh, of, of some of these markets. Uh, there is a, a very good friend of mine who used to do uh, real estate lending here in Europe and moved to uh, one of these uh, uh, Latin American countries where he was from. And he said that his biggest shock when he got there was that when he was doing lending here in, uh, in the UK for European companies, 
the key thing was to focus on the asset and the ability of the asset to uh, return the capital to the lender. The key focus on this uh, specific country in the country, uh, the specific uh, country on, on the lending side, was to get to know the borrower, the guy, that he shakes your hand and trusts that he will return your money. So, and, 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 and it, it's, it's a simplistic way of trying to understand how you do business. And that is something that if you want to be productive and you want to be comp competitive, you need to change. Interesting. I mean, in terms of, you know, we, 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 we talked a little bit about some of the success stories um, uh, in terms of companies and sectors. Um, what is it about the, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the Senexes and Embraers and so on. And if you look at sectors, I guess, you know, if you look at the Brazilian agriculture, for agribusiness as being an internationally competitive sector, many others in Latin America, but what is it that these companies or sectors have been able to do, given this, you know, collection of difficulties that, that impede productivity? What have they been able to do to, to supersede those problems? Maybe, maybe Leonardo, because your business, is, although it's a, a, a smaller business than BRF or MBA, it's smaller, yeah. <laughs> um, but you are an international consultancy now. You've been able to, from a Brazilian base, Brazilian roots, you've been able to develop an international business. What is it that you've been able to do at uh, Visaggio, um, which is, um, you know, maybe has lessons for... Yeah, in our case, I think we, it's, it's not about... Uh, uh, capital investment is not about um, uh, assets, it's really about intellectual capital, right? And I think in our case, I think uh, it's an example of uh, that Brazil can also ex export and create intellectual capital, which is very rare to see as a service business uh, going internationally. Um, for me, focus um, and recruiting talented people, yeah. Uh, and, and, and there is, I think, a discrepancy in, in the sense of people might think that Brazil doesn't produce great talent or the education is not that strong. And in fact, there are really excellent top schools in Brazil, like USP, UFRJ, uh, IME, ITA, top, top schools. Uh, and, and, and you can see examples also of um, Brazilian professionals and executives working in international companies, CEO of BAT, uh, you have um, in a way, uh, CEO of Renault Nissan, and then quite a lot of people uh, uh, living internationally. A lesson for us, I think, there are maybe three aspects. One is, um, Brazil can also apply great management practices, and I see AB in that case, or what, what, whatever the 3G group is doing is a great thing that they're doing. Uh, improving performance of Burger King, of Heinz, I think that's probably the first time in history I see uh, a regional Brazilian uh, group of executives leading internationally a uh, group of companies. Um, and more specifically to us, I think there is also a cultural aspect. Brazil do understand more emerging economies. And today, I think Visage International is 100% uh, international clients. Uh, there are only 40% of Brazilians working in, in Visage International. Uh, so we've merged with local talent, uh, and we do understand probably in a more unorthodox way how to do business in emerging economies. Um, and I think finally there is also a point about the management model uh, the Brazilian companies could adapt. Uh, I think linking really performance to, uh, to reward in a more aggressive way. And I think that's a practice that we do. That we do. Uh, and we fall in a way, um, a similar model to what um, the, uh, initially the guarantee uh, the 3G group has been doing. Um, and I think there is a lesson there as well for international, for Brazilian companies who wants to, uh, to be competitive, not based on currency exchange or, uh, or based on natural resources, but really if you want to be competitive, go abroad and, and, and be competitive in the international market by investing, being present. That's when you prove you are competitive, not by relying on, on currency exchange or on your need resources. So go invest internationally. Try to do it. Um, and, and I think that is, for me, uh, a, few, a few of the lessons learned so far. 
and 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 one final example is um, even the legal framework in Brazil it's not that favorable to create a global of let's say multinationals from Brazil uh, even for for shareholders I think it's a huge uh, it's, it's, there is a tax incentive for being a shareholder being Brazilian uh, and, and uh, owning assets internationally I think UK is a much has a much better framework for that. So you can't, in my view, be a Brazilian uh, global company. You can't, because of the current legal framework, you have to be based abroad to be a global business. I think if you look at, at uh, the progress that's been made in sectors, if it, there are areas where you can work without barriers, which are within an organization. If you look at, at the Brazilian sugar and biofuels industry, that's something which has enormously increased its productivity, working internally, tweaking the technology. I mean, I was born on a sugar plantation, and I just love going to these places and seeing how they've used every molecule. And, uh, or, or the oil industry, if you look at, at the technology within Petrobras, it has developed very well. The problem is when you go outside the boundaries and you meet the, the big bad world outside, which is heavily influenced by subsidies, regulations, governments, and, and all the, the creativity hits a, a, a wall of treacle. Oh, no, you can't have a wall of treacle, a pond of treacle. <laughs> I think just to complement also, I mean, there's an intrinsic challenge in Brazil in terms of education and the workforce. I mean, there is, I don't know if you have seen that, but uh, the salary inflation in Brazil uh, uh, went up very quickly in the past years. Now, currency exchange has helped, is helping at the moment. But we are, uh, I think two years ago, it was 30% more expensive, more costly for us uh, to bring a consultant from Brazil compared to London, which you might find, wow, how come? How, how come to, we, got, we got to that point? And uh, when we talk also to the, our Brazilian uh, clients, we say, well, they are also facing the same challenge. It's not only uh, at the senior management, but also at very grounded technical expertise. Yeah, in oil and gas, uh, maybe a bit less in mining, uh, maybe less in agriculture, but in the more uh, uh, technical, technically uh, demanding sectors, you see quite a lot of uh, lack of lack of people with the right skills, the right education, and I think that's um, it, it's a pity that we have not learned the lesson from from the past. What is, what is interesting that that we're touching a lot on competitiveness, and if we think about the nature of the economy of Latin America, in general, is a uh, uh, an economy that depends a lot on natural resources, on commodities. And the only way of being competitive when you trade commodities, when you try to make a profit out of commodities, is by being the lower cost producer. And you can think about it as a company, you can think about it as a country, you can think about it as a region. Um, if you produce soy, uh, you're not managing the price, you're only managing the cost. And, when the, and, and all of these commodities are cyclical, and when the prices start to drop, the only way of being competitive is making sure that you are the lowest cost producer. What kills most of these industries is not the productivity of the corporation itself, but the outside world. Of, so the institutionals, the laws, etc. And being Argentinian and hearing what you were saying before about being proud, it's, I moved into this country in 2000, and I have a big family, and I used to go to Smithfield to buy meats uh, because we like our barbecues. I used to buy Argentinian beef, and I could, I now I only buy Uruguayan beef or Brazilian beef, which is, if you think about where Argentina was, is, and it's not because they're not, it's probably one of the best agricultural advances, technologies in the world. People go there, but the environment can, had created something that we haven't touched, but I think it affects a lot the productivity, populism and protectionism, that at the end of the day, it costs a lot to the countries, 
and it's what makes it less competitive and, on the long term, what creates poverty. You asked about the success cases. Uh, not by accident, most of the examples we, we discussed here are uh, goods that are exported or imported, so the, expo the exposure to foreign markets um, makes a difference because it must be competitive, so on and so forth. But there are some other interesting situations and again, being a, a little bit optimistic about the regional integration thing. In those segments and industry in which regulation across country is more reasonable, so there is no need to protect individual groups or family in, within specific countries, uh, you can develop business in which the gains of, uh, in terms of productivity and competitiveness are, are huge. Just to give one example that we had at, at Patria, we run the largest um, um, waterway company in Latin America. So we transport uh, soybeans, minerals um, that are produced basically in the Midwest of Brazil. And then we have the North Corridor and then we export towards the Northeast and then this goes to the United States and Europe. And then we have the South Corridor that does the, 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 the flow to um, China, basically grains and, and minerals as well. Just exploring the intelligent regulation or the lack of protectionism and, and populism. Uh, the headquarters of this company called, uh, the company is called Hidrovias, uh, basically the headquarters in Sao Paulo. But the navigation company that does the, the push boats and deals with the push boats on barges is in Paraguay. And the terminal we use to export to China is Obrinel in, in Montevideo. So it's a Brazilian company with a shipping company located in Paraguay exporting through Chile, uh, sorry, through Uruguay. This is an interregional thing. Legislation is fine. Regularly. And then just to give an example, if you compare the cost of transport with, with this waterway compared to trucks, you're talking about one-sixth. So it's much, much less expensive and much more efficient to do this, not to talk about environmental issues. So this is something that is materialized three, four years ago, and there is significant room to do more in Latin America, just exploring something that's a little bit different from exports of commodities and doing the, the natural resources storage. So yeah, there are certain sectors that it's just a matter of time they will pop up on the ra radar screen and people will see that, that there is room for improvement in these other regions, industries that have nothing to do with. It's more logistic rather than, than commodity production. Guys, we, we're uh a minute and a half to go, so perhaps just, um, you know, to sum up really. Um, institutions, the big issue as far as, pr to sum up what we, what we said really, productivity is improving in Latin America, but there's a long way to go. Institutions are the overwhelming barrier. The best practice has been where there's a kind of enclave um, uh, where, where you've got a lot of control, we can tweak things, as, as Mark puts it or where there's these little, air, particularly these areas of cross-border activity where, 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 where there's no vested interests, where you've got to have seen quite a lot of progress in, in recent years, and then within the individual companies with exceptional cases, really. Too complex, particular reasons to go into right now, we don't have time, but um, I think we, we, we will finish there, and, and sorry if we brought it to a bit of an abrupt conclusion, but um, someone keeps putting a a piece of paper up saying five minutes and one minute and so on. So, <laughs> thanks. Hi, thank you for, for your insights in this panel discussion. My name is Tiago, I'm a first year MBA student. And uh, you, you have all mentioned that um, increasing the, the strength of institutions is very important for. Uh, in, improving competitiveness in Latin America. And my question to you is, what, what do you think is the role of the private sector, and I'm not talking about the public sector, but, the, but companies, on increasing the perception of institutions in, in the region? You cannot blame governments, because governments get elected by people. So uh, it's not fair to say that uh, uh, all of the uh, changes have to be on the institutional side from the politicians or from the government side. I think that uh, those countries that succeed is where the industry, the private sector, gets very involved in politics, but does it not for selfishness or its own benefits. Uh, one of the things I admire the most about the US 
is the way that business people go back to the uh, to the sector. Uh, you see all these big and very uh, wealthy bankers going and uh, working for the government. They're not doing it just because they're nice human beings. Everyone has uh, a kind of a, uh, an, an idea of wanting to do well, but also thinking about their pocket. And the U.S. has an amazing motivation that if you go and work for the government, all your wealth that you have earned at that time freezes, goes into a, um, a fund managed by the government where you have no influence, and after you've serviced three years, you get it back tax-free. So it's, it's a very simple way of the government, which is not paying you huge salaries, allowing you not to pay capital gains tax on a fortune that you might have earned for many, many years, and for you to give all your experience back to the government. Things like that are things that the private sector should be uh, uh, raising, bringing to the institutional, to the politicians, to try to work more as a partnership. And as I said before, I think the biggest enemy is populism, because populism is really what on the short term kills, uh, uh, on the medium term kills the productivity and the uh, development of some of these countries. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for coming and for participating to the debate. I'm Luis, I'm a first year student here, Brazilian first year student at London Business School. And Mr. Wehara talked about um, shortage of, um, of uh, qualified workforce in Brazil. So in Brazil, in spite of a strong inflation of wages, we still see a lot of students here that want to stay abroad and don't, don't want to go back to Brazil. And we see it's very hard to immigrate to Brazil. So uh, foreigners that want to go to Brazil that don't know how or can't. Do you believe that uh, institutions have played a role to play in the, um, attracting talent to Brazil or facilitating the, their way to Brazil? I'm well, not an expert on, on the immigration side, but I do believe that um, when you look at the statistics, I think the number of uh, f uh, expats and also qualified workers that are going to Brazil has increased significantly in the past years. Um, and also, if I'm graduated from the London Business School in 2007, uh, we were 12 Brazilians, um, and there is only myself and another um, colleague that has stayed in, in London. So I think, in a way, uh, it proves that a point that well, Brazil managed to attract them back because also of their salary and the competitiveness of salaries um, against the European, uh, European market. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andres. I'm coming from Imperial College. Uh, my question is, to which extent do you think Latin America succeeded investing in diversifying their econ its economy besides Mexico and Brazil. What do you think about Chile, Peru, and Colombia? Uh, did they diversify enough to survive to this commodity uh, crisis right now and how it affects the competitiveness for the future? Well, if you take the long-term trend uh, growth in all the region, um, if you correct or you normalize for the fluctuation in commodity prices, um, you see that the role or the share of the increase in domestic market consumption, the household consumption, is actually the most important uh, contributor for the extra growth that has been recorded over the past uh, one or two decades. So most of the people associate Latin America with uh, commodities because we expect Latin countries export a lot of commodities and it's the, mo the easiest or the most liquid asset if you want to, to invest long term or to build up a portfolio of stocks or bonds, etc. But if you, again, if you do the analysis, correct for the fluctuation of, of commodity prices over the long term and ask the question, what is the most important new contribu contributor for growth? expansion of domestic market. Of course, there are some, some, some differences. Um, Chile is, uh, for World Bank standards, for example, it's, a, it's an OECD country already. It's a medium high um, income country, and it's relatively small. We're talking about 12, 13 million people. But if you go to Brazil, Peru, um, Colombia, 
the growth of domestic market, household consumption is very impressive. This is, will change the, the, the characteristics of how these countries are seen over time. It's, it's a matter of time. They will continue to be competitive in the commodity space, but it will be more and more a domestic market story. Mexico is a little bit different because there's this deep integration in the U.S. and then it's a little more difficult to know is this whether domestic story market, actually most of these stories related to household consumption in Mexico are less spectacular than people expected, but the integration in the U.S. Is, 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 it plays a significant role. And then you have this smallest, smallest economy like in Central America, the Caribbean, in which uh, it's going to be less a uh, story of domestic market, but more integration with the regional hubs, with an awful lot of tourism in there as well, so it's very competitive in there. So probably they will gravitate around this big Latin domestic market. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a problem which uh, applies right around the world, is how you take the... Uh, heritage of resources and either you spend the money or you invest the money and uh, how you use it. And there are good and bad examples from all around the world. You can look at, at countries like Malaysia which have transformed themselves, I think, not, not perfect. Uh, in the Middle East you see bad examples, good examples. Oman has transformed, not, it, it's, it's used it. Uh, Africa, some good, Botswana good, you know, Nigeria not so good. Uh, it's, there are lessons from everywhere, uh, but the answer is investment and in infrastructure, I think, something which other industries can use and the integration and the supply chain. Uh, I could give a whole lecture on it. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm, uh, I work at Salamanca Group as an analyst. I, you mentioned the weakness of institutions presenting one of the big challenges of productivity and competitiveness in Latin America. I work a lot with the um, corruption issues and compliance issues. I was wondering how you think more robust anti-corruption legislation, I'm thinking particularly of in Brazil at the moment, the Clean Company Act, whose regulation will be further defined this year, um, how far that will go to help increase competitiveness in Latin America and how far problems with um, corruption and bribery and so on has affected um, investor appetite in Latin America. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think corruption everywhere in the world is an enormous problem because not simply does it divert resources, it also distorts economies, so it, it, it means that for people make choices for bad reasons, and corruption has many forms, including vested interests, so vested interests blocking the development of a certain area. Uh, you can try and do things by legislation, uh, but most countries have laws already, it's a, so laws are not the, the not necessarily the solution. Clearly, fearless uh, imposition of the laws uh, by uh, uh, you know brave people who, in many cases, take their life in their hands to actually uh, progress it is important. Uh, but I think industries, you have to address this thing on an industry by industry basis. So it means actually building within an industry a group of people who say, okay, what are the corruption problems in our in which affect our industry? What's it doing? Can we form alliances by which, because everyone, nobody wants someone else to get an advantage because, you know, you're being more honest than they are. Uh, so you have to kind of work at it collectively as a society. It's a, it's a very difficult problem, but I think it's one that we need to pay much more and it is a problem in Latin America. I don't know what the, uh, I think the biggest bribe I was ever asked for was $35 million. <laughs> we didn't pay it. <laughs> okay, we have time Thank for you. one more question. Hi, good morning. My name is Alejandro Echeverria from London and Partners. 
I guess my question comes more from the entrepreneur SME side of things. You talked a lot about the big companies going internationally and the challenges they face in Latin America. Uh, f from a London perspective, we see a lot of Asian, um, African, even uh, yeah, even African companies from the SME and entrepreneur side coming to London wishing to internationalize their operation. And when we look at the numbers, the Latin American figures are quite small. So I guess my question is, what is the biggest challenge for the entrepreneur or the SME wishing to internationalize or scale up in an international arena? Thank you. I think um, I, I can't speak for on behalf of all Latin America, but I, f I can speak on behalf of of, uh, of what we did. Um, uh, normally, Brazilian companies have two kind of options. They normally have better ties or better relationship, or they have less fear of the U.S. So they tend to they might tend to well op start in the U.S. is the way to uh, to go international. In our case, I think. London, if I'm a big uh, sponsor of, of, of having uh, the UK as a hub for your international expansion. And I think in our case, I think if you look at the, uh, I think we have run 50 projects in the past four years, um, I would say 90% is outside of the UK. So if you want to go international, the UK is an excellent hub to grow your firm or your company uh, and, and, and get it wherever you want really, because uh, I think that's a, it's a well-connected, uh, super well-located geographically. Um, you can reach uh, from London, I think you were talking here before about uh, flights in, flights out. Um, at the same time, it has an excellent legal framework for a growing international organization. Um, I think the other aspect is uh, if you are uh, not just an export, but really want to, um, to go, grow internationally, is at the end of the day, it comes down to vision, leadership, things that we learn at London Business School. Um, how can you attract talent, uh, talent people, apart from just being an investor in, uh, in bringing cash and assets? Um, so you, so having a, an, ex, an exciting company uh, that allows you to compete uh, against or, uh, European companies there are very, very, um, I mean, you just look at the consulting market here, there are 600 consulting companies, uh, 400 in operations management, so it's super competitive. So you need to be tailor your, your value proposition, you need to be much more, let's um, um, uh, say, you have to have much more edge yeah, on what you offer and, and come back to what your strengths are. Um, so yeah, that's probably my <laughs> some of my thoughts. What, what I would also add is that people, I would think, always make a mistake. They think about uh, the U.S. and Europe in the same way. And when you think about international growth, when you grow in the U.S., you're growing in a single market with whatever 250 million people that has the same, in general, leg just legislation all over the country. If you come and grow t in Europe, you're not growing in Europe. You're growing in, I don't know how many countries you have now in the EU, but a lot of different jurisdictions where it's very difficult to do uh, business in each of the different jurisdictions. For us as a bank, our productivity in Europe is 20% below what the productivity is in the US. So when you have a, you're a much smaller organization, it's very difficult to go and conquer Europe in the same way that you go and conquer the US. And also, if you look at Europe as a whole, and the influence that it has in Latin America as a whole, not country by country, is not that much smaller than the U.S. is. And you look at the ties that you have in Brazil with Portugal, in Brazil with France, in Germany with Mexico, in Spain with Mexico, if you look at it as a whole, it's not that different. The thing is that in Europe you think country by country, and the U.S. takes the lion's share. I think that concludes. We are out of time now. Thank you very much, Mr. Leppard. Mr. Bunge, Sir Mark, Luis, uh, Leonardo, and Mr. O'Connor, thank you very much. Uh, we are now going for a networking break, and the next presentation by Mr. Carlos Fernandez starts at 11.20. Thank you very much. Thank you.